my name is Jean-Paul Biberian, and uh, I am from the University of Marseille, but actually I, reti I retired 10 years ago. And now I have my own laboratory at home so that I can work almost 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And um, uh, I will talk today about a very important topic, which is transmutations. Uh, why do we need trans transmutation? I will give you an introduction to explain you that. Then we see light elements like helium tritium measurements. Then we go to different ways of making transmutation like electrochemistry, chemistry, gas phase experiments, discharges, and then we go to a conclusion. So let's start by the introduction. Uh, what is transmutation? I mean, uh, people know transmutation because of the alchemists, you know, they were producing gold, supposedly, supposedly producing gold. Anyway, in the modern days, we know that we can make transmutation. And we do that every day in the nuclear reactors. And there are two ways of doing transmutation. One is by fusion, and the other one is by fission. Fusion is fusing two light elements to make a heavier element. And fission is breaking up a, light, a heavy element to make lighter elements. Fusion can be produced by fusing two hydrogen or deuterium atoms, or maybe a hydrogen atom with a metal atom. That's another possibility. It's also fusion. And fission is obtained when you split a heavy element. Why do we need that? It's very important to verify a theory that will explain cold fusion. I mean, um, to do a theory, you need data. And data, you need to correct them by doing experiments. There's no way you can make a theory without data because you need your theory to fit with the data. So in this presentation, we will look at, uh, we will not look at biological transmutations, which is another very exciting field I worked in, but uh, it's not the, object, the subject of today's talk. Why is it important? We want to understand the origin of the anomalous heat that's been measured by many, many, many scientists. And also we would like to know not only the appearance of some elements, but also the disappearance of some elements. So if we can see something appearing and then another, another one disappearing, that's very positive. So you have some the clue of a theory. Now let's go to the light elements first. Helium-4 and tritium. Miles, I mean, at least uh, six, seven, eight groups have done helium measurements, but um, here are only a few. Miles, I made ex very good experiments where he was measuring excess heat and helium production. And every time he had excess heat, he had helium, no excess heat, no helium. So it's a good correlation between helium and excess heat, indicating it's not a leak. I mean, people think there is a leak or in the system, but this is uh, the fact that you have only helium when you have excess heat, prove that there's something in the, the, the mechanism there that's producing the helium four. Godzi in Italy did something very similar. You have here two curves. Look at the, the time anyway, because this is 1200 hours. So that's 50 days. I mean, these are slow, slow reactions, you know, it takes time to do this kind of work because you don't produce much helium when you do reactions. I mean, the nuclear reaction is 1 million times more effective than a chemical reaction. So in order to produce some helium, you need to have a lot, it takes a lot of time to build up helium. Anyway, uh, this is a curve. You see in black, the production of helium and when you're deuterium and where it's only light water, you have no deuterium produced. Another very important player in this field is Arata. He's a Japanese scientist and he had a very smart design. So he developed this, what he called the double cathode, which is actually a hollow tube of, a tube of palladium filled with palladium black. Palladium black is a powder of palladium. So the whole thing is sealed. And then he does electrolysis. This is a platinum anode. So he does electrolysis with heavy water. So when heavy water dissociates at the surface of the cathode, deuterium, ions are produced and they diffuse inside the, inside the wall of the tube 
go inside the powder and build up the pressure inside and loads the palladium black with deuterium. And this is the calorimeter is using, but this is the, the cell with the react the, the electrochemical cell, and he's using a mass flow calorimetry that is putting cold water and collecting hot water, and by measuring the mass flow and the difference in temperature, you can calculate the heat produced. Actually, he has produced heat, but this is not the, the point here, what we are looking at for helium production. So here you can see the graphs. On top, he has done experiment with light water, I mean, ordinary water, and you see there is no helium produced here. But when he puts heavy water instead, he, see, he sees a helium peak appearing here, which is not the present when there's no, deter no deuterium. So definitely this is a very good proof that is producing helium-4 also. So we have three experiments here that are really without any uh, critics about it. Makubri has done something very interesting. Actually, he's not the inventor of this system. Less case, less the case, he's an engineer and he tried all kinds of catalysts. So finally find one that worked. It's actually palladium deposited on coconut. So what, I mean, this is a normal catalyst that you use in the industry. So you fill this, this jar with this powder, this catalyst with palladium on it. And then he did some cleaning, putting hydrogen, oh, sorry, went back, putting hydrogen and then deuterium, heating it up, cleaning up the, the oxide of the palladium. And finally, it was getting excess heat. So Mike McCubrey at SRI used this equipment and did an experiment measuring helium-4 with this type of apparatus. So it's the gas phase. And here you can see on the x-axis the amount of helium produced and on the vertical axis, the energy produced. So you can see that there is a good correlation between the amount of excess heat and the amount of helium. It's, it's a proof that there is a, uh, a relation between the two. Now, you can explain that by the D plus D reaction, but maybe there are other reactions that could give the same result. Here you can see the buildup of helium-4 with days. You know, Again, these are very long period of time. It takes 30 days to get that much helium-4. Tritium production. Uh, Makubri used one of these double cathodes of uh, Arata and uh, he measured not helium, not only helium, but also he found tritium in it. And actually he also found helium-3. I didn't mention it, but he also found helium-3. And the, the funny thing with helium-3 is that helium-3 is extremely rare on Earth. There's plenty on the moon, but not on Earth. And um, it's a most, one of the most expensive materials you can buy, helium-3. And um, when he brought it to a lab specialized in measuring helium-3, he saturated the equipment. So there was a lot of helium-3. Why do we have helium-3? This corresponds to one of the reactions. When you, if you deuterium, two deuterium atoms together, you should form tritium, helium-3, or helium-4. So the three have been found, but the most common is helium-4. Clater. Clater was working at Los Alamos and he did some sparking between electrodes made of palladium. He tried different types of materials and he could see the formation of tritium. I mean, Los Alamos is very familiar with the measurement of tritium. So there's no doubt he could find tritium. But unfortunately for him, it didn't work every time. By electrochemistry now, Miley, George Miley did experiments and then he analyzed the electrodes he has used as cathode made of palladium. And to his great surprise, he found all kinds of elements. I mean, you see almost all the table of elements. Some are very low quantities, but there are peaks. You see there's a peak here at low mass, second peak here, third peak here, fourth peak here, fifth peak here, where you have concentration of these elements that are happening. You know. 
So there is a pattern. But what is very, very exciting is that Mizuno in Japan found something very similar, same kind of pattern. It was a different experiment, different everything, and they found the same pattern. So there's something there that has some reality behind it, which has to be explained by the theory when one day people will make theories about it. Um, I, had, uh, I was very lucky to know Stan Pons, and uh, one day he gave me one of his electrodes used in one of his Eucharist 9 calorimeter. So Eucharist 9 is designed to work at boiling temperature on, on a continuous way, you know. So you can have constant boiling and boiling, the water vapor condensates and comes back inside so you can run it for a long time. Yet one of these electrodes he said to me that this electrode produced a lot of heat. So he gave me the electrode and I had it in my drawer for quite a few years. And one day I had the chance to go to a SIMS equipment and I took this sample, a piece of the sample, this is the electrode. The electrode was originally 10 centimeter long and two millimeter in diameter. So I brought this, uh, this electrode to a SIMS, dynamic SIMS equipment and we did the analysis and we found some hot spots, not everywhere, but there were hot spots where you could see a difference between silver 107 and silver 109. Why normally the natural distribution of silver 107 and silver 109 are identical, I mean, within 1% or 2%. So that's what you see here at the, at the end, you see they have the same concentration. But at the beginning, that means at the surface, there's a lot more 107. So that means that the reaction produces 107, which is interesting because there's one, only one isotope out of the two. This is probably a fusion between one isotope of palladium and one isotope and a deuterium ion. Now let's see what's happening in gas phase. Freilich, Freilich works at NASA and in 1989, he published a memorandum about one experiment that he did. So what he did, he borrowed from one of his colleagues, uh, a hydrogen purifier. The, the purifier is made of an alloy of palladium and silver. So what he did, at that time he was looking for radiation, I mean, some kind of neutrons or gamma rays. So he used, he took this, um, this, purifier, filled it with, with deuterium inside and outside, heated it up and left it for quite a few days, hoping to see neutrons or gamma rays. There was nothing coming out. So after a while, this colleague asked for the purifier again. So he pumped the hydrogen out, the deuterium out, and to his great surprise, <laughs> the temperature went up when he was pumping the deuterium out of this, this palladium. And as you know, thermodynamics, usually when you pump, you cool down. So there was heating. So he repeated the experiment several times. He tried with pure hydrogen, natural hydrogen. There was no heating, it was cooling. But when he put deuterium, there was heating instead of cooling. So he published a memorandum, memorandum and in this memorandum, he said that if you're looking for radiation, there's none, but if you want heat, there is heat. Now, years later, almost, almost 30 years later, they decided to do an analysis of the surface of this tube to see if something has changed. So there grew, there's a large group of people that work on that and they found hotspots and they went and analyzed these hotspots. They found new elements, again, very similar, I mean, titanium, calcium, iron, zinc. I mean, you name it, aluminum, silicon. Again, everything was there. So again, we have split the palladium into something else. It's a fission reaction. Now, Iwamura. Iwamura used to work at uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and he developed a very unique system. It made a uh, multi-layers, it made multi-layers of palladium and calcium oxide deposited on a, on a palladium foil. And on top of these layers at the surface, it deposited 
some different elements like cesium first. Then you put that in this chamber here. Chamber is equipped with a XPS photoelectron spectrometer, which is very sensitive. You can analyze surfaces with very good accuracy. And you see only the two or three layers of the surface. You don't see the bulk of the material. You don't see, you see only the surface. So you fill the chamber with deuterium, you pumped it, stopped the pumping, did the analysis, put back the deuterium, pumped again, put, and did cycles like that. So you measure the surface composition. And what's interesting is that if you look at the time, you see the cesium peak going down and the new peak appears, which is prasodinium. So you have changed cesium into prasodinium. Now, instead of cesium, you can put something else. You try strontium. Now, if you do the same thing with strontium, you, you see the strontium peak is going down, but now you have a new peak, which is molybdenum. Now, this is surprising. If you look at the isotopic distribution of the molybdenum, he has observed up here, and this is natural molybdenum, which is really different of what he has measured, indicating that he has produced new elements with an abnormal isotopic composition. He has later he tried all kinds of different elements and, did, and found very similar behaviors. Mastro Matteo. Mastro Matteo Ubaldo Mastro Matteo did a very exciting, interesting experiment also. He took a one quarter centimeter slice of silicon, wafer, silicon, wafer of silicon, deposited on top of it a thin film of palladium. He put it in a hydrogen atmosphere and it, it did shine on it a, a red pointer laser. After some time, when he analyzed it on the electron, the electron microscope, he saw some hot spots here, dark, you can see them. And then when he did the analysis, he found new elements that were not there. Nickel, calcium, iron, I mean, everything you gain, strontium, aluminum, you, you, same pattern, amazing, exactly same pattern. So as I met, when I met Baldo, it gave me also some samples of the same material. So I did the same experiment. And I did that just before the start of the COVID saga, you know. So we were just locked down. So instead of two weeks, I left it for three months under the laser beam. And after three months, I went to the lab and analyzed it with an electron microscope. And to my great surprise, I saw this huge hotspot here, which is 150 micro in diameter. There's some other, other hotspots here and there. And when we did the analysis at the center, but there are also analysis on the other side, you can see also changes, but the most interesting is the center. Because in the center, palladium has almost disappeared. Almost no palladium, 0.25%. 7.28%, 7.04%. I mean, palladium has disappeared and all kinds of new elements have appeared. I mean, nitrogen, I mean, you cannot have nitrogen. The nitrogen, I mean, splitting the nitrogen gas is kind of impossible. It's a very stable molecule and there's no nitrogen anyway because there's only hydrogen in the chamber. So we have nitrogen, we have all these elements, sodium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, manganese, iron, I mean, nickel, it's amazing, zinc. Again, same types of elements. Then look at discharges. Rutskoyev is a Russian scientist and he did a very unique experiment once. He took a titanium foil, like a fuse, put uh, large capacitors with a lot of, uh, lot of charges. I mean, huge capacity, like 3000 volt capacitors and made a very quick discharge. And when you do that, you blow up the fuse. And when he analyzed what, what, what was left, he found that the titanium 40, 48, and in dark, you see the natural composition, and gray, the new composition. And you see 
that the new composition shows there's a strong decrease of the titanium 48 and the increase of the other elements. So there is a transmutation happening starting with titanium 48. Now, if you look at uh, the composition of some of the debris, you see all kinds of new elements again, zinc, iron, titanium, calcium, silver, etc. I mean, again, we have the same thing that's happening. Conclusion. Okay, both fusion and fission products have been measured with various experimental techniques. Patterns are very identical, very similar. Helium-4 has been measured. It's in agreement with a DD reaction regarding the energy produced. I mean, the DD reaction would produce 23 MeV, and that's about what has been measured. But it's not a proof, but it's a good indication. And only one case, we have seen that uh, the disappearance of one element, appearance of the new element, a new one, the one uh, with the multi-layers by Iwamura, which is very exciting because here you see one element disappearing and new one appearing. That's what we need to find more. So more work needs to be done, especially with isotopic analysis, because there we are sure it's not the pollution. Thank you very much for your attention.